Well, hello there, City Church family and friends. Welcome to day number eight, as we are now in Luke chapter eight. And Peter, again, this is another big chapter that begins with a parable that Jesus teaches. We're not going to deal with the parable, but you're going to talk about parables in general. So why don't you share with us about the parables Jesus tells? Well, to be more accurate, it starts with this list of women who accompany Jesus. And right. I haven't noticed this before filming these videos, but it always seems like before Jesus does a big teaching in Luke, Luke gives us like a list of who follows mm. Jesus. There's mm. the 12 disciples teaching on the plane, this list, and then it's about to start off as proof. What's that about? I don't know, but anyway. Right. Um, so Jesus starts here to give us a chunk of, of parables. And there's this uh, slightly unsettling things that happen where Jesus sort of tells him, Jesus tells his disciples that he speaks in parables um, to hide things from people from whom they should yes. be hidden. And yeah. that's a bit of an unsettling idea that Jesus is kind of like, it sounds almost like Jesus says, I'm speaking nonsense so that people won't hear me. Correct. And uh, what are we supposed to do with that? Well, one of the things that some theologians have suggested is that Maybe it's not so much that Jesus is speaking in parables that people won't hear in the sense that he's trying to throw folks off the trail, but that the barrier to hearing the parables is important to hearing the parables. Okay. So on one base level, there's a thought that, well, maybe Jesus sometimes speaks in these parables and these metaphors because they're actually a way of saying explosive revolutionary things without being killed. Okay. Um, so some of the parables are going to like so he's kind of cloaking Challenge them. Rome, yeah. yeah. Uh, another one, uh, another thing that some theologians note is that there are some kinds of speech uh, that once you hear them, they can't get unheard. And so I could say, for instance, like we are filming these videos, and that's a very blatant fact. Right. But I could also say like, I promise we're going to do 10 more of these today. Well, what I've said has actually just changed our world. Like it's because I've promised that we're going right, to. Right. Some theologians have noted the way in which parables work like that, where parable, if you really hear the parable, if you really understand what Jesus is saying in the parable of the sower and the conditions of the heart, it changes how you see your life and where you sit. And so maybe one of the ways in which Jesus is hiding things from people and speaking in parables is that these aren't easy things to hear content-wise. It's easy to hear, like, we're recording videos and the sun is outside. Right. It is much harder to hear things like, we are called to lay down our lives. Mm -hmm. And so parables function in that way. Uh, they, they function, their form, uh, which is a little bit um, metaphorical or allegorical, actually is there to carry a message which itself uh, needs to be heard in order to be heard. And so as we read other parables in Luke, um, like Luke 15 is going to be a string of parables that are crowned with the prodigal son, to keep in mind that Jesus works this way uh, with parables, I think is important for Jesus's theology of parables, right. maybe. And I think it's also important to say too, Peter, that parables have a way of drawing us in. Whereas if he just said some emphatic truth, people would be like, uh, but a parable has a way of drawing you in. And I think that we've talked about before how the, the way the Bible is written primarily, it, it doesn't just lay it out for you. It calls you to dig and to search and to seek and to find. And in, in the Eastern mind, which is how the Bible's written, if you have to dig, search and seek, you're actually going to learn. And if someone just spoon feeds you, you're not as quick to internalize and to learn. So parables kind of draw you in. They force you to think, put yourself in the parable, yeah. and to really exercise yourself into the midst of those. Yeah, we live in a world of information where no. it's not, it is not clear to most of us Westerners why you can't just tell it to me simple. Give me a data dump. Right. Womp. Um, yes. But the ancient world is not a world of information. And the belief is that how, there's a sense that how you learn something changes what's you're learning. You know, yeah. everyone loves a good story, which is a great transition to the other part of this chapter right, we want to talk right. about, yeah. which starts in verse 26. And uh, this is just kind of to mention it briefly, but yet again, we aren't making this up. There's another demonic encounter yes. with Jesus. Yes. Um, and this one is pretty famous. Uh, uh, all the Gospels have an account of this, the so-called Gerasene demoniac or Gadarene demoniac. Um, in one gospel, it's two, but it's this encounter that Jesus has where he casts demons out of a man on the other side of the Sea of Ga Galilee 
in the region of, of the Gerasenes, a, a group of Gentiles. Um, yes. And so uh, I think we just want to point this out again as we're looking with particular interest at the Holy Spirit and the spiritual in Luke. Sure, sure. Um, that here's another moment in Jesus's ministry where uh, a demonic um, encounter happens to him. Yes. Um, and maybe something that's helpful to kind of drop in our minds right now is Jesus never seems to be nervous right. in any of these encounters. And they, as much as they um, might seem dramatic for us, they don't seem dramatic for him. Uh, to heal somebody, to meet somebody new, to bring someone into the kingdom of God, to speak an authoritative word, and to encounter a demon, they all happen very naturally in the sweep of Jesus' day. Sure. Um, what one friend of mine calls naturally supernatural. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's interesting to note, too, that Jesus seems like he's a magnet mm -hmm. for spiritual activity. But that makes sense, right? Jesus is the king. He's ushering in this new spiritual kingdom. And when this new kingdom begins to invade, and I love it, he's across the sea. He's in Gentile territory, which is a clear sign that this kingdom isn't just for Israel. This kingdom has crossed the sea. It's starting to invade another area. And instantly, the adversary shows up, but then the adversary adversary gets cast out. And I think, it, again, uh, the idea of an opposing spiritual force, the Bible's comfortable talking about this. And I think we need to be open to that as well. So, Peter, is there anything else that comes well, to mind here? It seems in this story that we see really, really clearly that this spiritual force um, is associated with death um, and that Jesus is associated with life. And mm. so you have this man um, who cuts, who harms himself, um, and who lives amongst the tombs. And there is an affinity, it seems, in his life for pain, for suffering, for, for death. darkness, for death. Yes. And then Jesus comes along and casts out the demons who name themselves Legion, mm -hmm. um, which would be uh, a, a thousand of them. That's that's what a thousand Roman soldiers are called. And so uh, here you have this moment where Jesus cast out the demons from the man um, who was inflicting pain in his own life, who chose to live around remembrances of death. And at the end, it says that he is found in his right mind. Mm -hmm. um, and the word here is a word that is developed in ancient, uh, ancient Greece um, to talk about the way in which people have to have a certain kind of habit or a certain kind of posture in order to live together. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sophosteros, this in his right mind, is a signifier to us that he's become the kind of person that can re-enter community. Um, in the ancient Near Eastern imagination, death was about disillusion or dissipation, and life is about connection and flourishing. Um, and so when bodies die, they decay, uh, but when communities flourish, things come together. And this is exactly the story we see. Jesus takes a man who's been isolated in suffering around death, and he casts out his demons so that he can be brought back into community well and dressed and in his right mind. And you know, Peter, I think it's at this point where I would like to give a huge shout out for a book by a gentleman by the name of Rob Reamer and the book that he wrote called Soul Care. And Soul Care is a book where uh, we've had hundreds of people here at City Church go through this book. And it's, it's a way in which we bring ourselves to Jesus and he frees us up from spiritual stuff, from our emotional stuff, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we find that it's similar for us to where people who have had bouts with fear, people that have had hatred or bitterness or any number of things that have kept them from relating well to others, um, that book, Soul Care, and I'm going to put a link to it in the email so that people can kind of move forward with that if they'd like to get the book and read it, and I'd encourage them to do that. Jesus isn't done freeing people up and, uh, and blessing them with the power of the Spirit, and they're able to enter back into a healthier relationship because of who he is. So that's a very, very exciting thing. Peter, the last thing we're going to talk about is here we discover that Jesus raises a dead girl um, and heals a sick woman. And the only comment I have about that is, is that when Jesus raises this dead girl, it's not a resurrection. It's actually a resuscitation. And I, this may be splitting theological hairs, but I think it's important to say this. Oftentimes I'll hear people say, well, Jesus resurrected Lazarus, or no, 
A resurrected body is what Jesus gets after his resurrection, where, yes, there are symbols and signs of his suffering on him, but he's able to walk through walls. He has a total new body. The Apostle Paul says we will get one of those so that we can live in heaven forever. But I think it's important to say that when Jesus raises someone from the dead, it's not a resurrection. It's a resuscitation where life gets put back into them that has left them. But that's very different than the resurrection that Jesus experiences from the dead. I think the difference between them is that uh, if you, uh, no offense, but if you mistakenly believe that this is a resurrection as opposed to a resuscitation, mm -hmm. I think you probably have too small a theology of death. Uh, if you think that death is what happens to your body at the end of your life, um, then I would encourage you to go back through the scriptures uh, or to keep journeying with us and to take a look at how, um, well, Paul will be the person who says this most strongly, what death is for the Bible. Um, this gets complicated in various ways, especially if you're a theologian who wants to engage with biologists mm -hmm. of various kinds. But what we see in Jesus um, is actually who's someone who moves from life under the reign of death to death under the reign of death to life itself in the resurrection. What we see um, in this young girl is she moves from life under the reign of death to death, back to life under the reign of death, waiting for the final consummation of the kingdom of God. And so uh, the, the unfortunate moral of the story, but I think something that comes as the um, helpful bad news or the good news of Jesus is that all of us are still living under the reign of death. Not just that our bodies will die, but all these other facets of our life, like we saw with the Gerasene demoniac, are about this power in the world called death. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' resurrection is the moment when that is defeated. Yes. Well, I think that brings us to the end of our thoughts for today. So, Peter, as we end day eight, I'm going to send us out in prayer. So let's pray together. Well, Jesus, thank you for who you are and the victory that you bring. Thank you in the story that we just read. There was someone who couldn't relate at all to others, was broken, dysfunctional, where death had invaded them. And yet when he met you, you set him free. Jesus, I pray the same over my own life, over Peter, over Jonathan, who's helping us make these videos, and to everyone in the audience that's listening to this video. I pray in the name of Jesus that all of us, through Christ, would find that those things that keep us from living fully and freely in community, that Jesus, in your name, these would be defeated. I also pray a blessing over those who will go out and get the book Soul Care by Rob Reamer and really go through the work of being freed up from ourselves so that Christ can truly touch us and set us free. Lord, thank you for the power of this story in Luke 8. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow at Luke chapter 9.